Now it's time for Lefties Losing It. We've got not one, but two ladies of The View coming up shortly. But first, let's start with Taylor Swift, possibly the biggest pop star in the world today. And she's recently endorsed Kamala Harris, but it's not the first time she's backed a political candidate. Sadly, it appears Swift, who has built a stellar career writing songs about her many bad choices, appears to be what is called a low-information voter. Just have a look at this ill-informed, emotional diatribe about Republican Marsha Blackburn. Taylor Swift comes out against Trump. I don't care if they write that. I'm sad that I didn't two years ago, but I can't change that. I'm saying right now that this Hold is up. something that I know is right, and you guys, I need to be on the right side of history. Yeah, and if he Taylor. doesn't win, then at least I, I, at least I try. It really is a big deal to me. She votes against, against fair pay for women. She votes against the reauthorization of the of the Violence Against Women Act, which is just basically protecting us from domestic abuse and stalking, stalking. She votes, she thinks that, that if you're a gay couple, or even if you look like a gay couple, you should be allowed to be kicked out of a restaurant. It's really basic human rights, and it's right and wrong at this point. And I can't see another commercial and see her disguising these policies behind the words Tennessee Christian values. That's from Swift's 2020 Netflix documentary, Miss Americana. And the nonsense she's spewing there is about Republican Marsha Blackbird. And guess what? Even in her home state in 2018, Taylor's activism failed to move the dial. Marsha Blackburn won with a big majority in Tennessee. Huge. Mm. Now let's check in with the mad ramblings of the ladies of The View. And apparently it's opposite day on the program because despite two assassination attempts against Donald Trump in as many months and a number of other violent attacks from the left, it is the Republicans and Trump that are to blame. Let's hear this angry tirade from Whoopi Goldberg. Remember when she was likeable and sane? And also, let's stop this thing. You know, let's stop this both sides stuff. It's a bunch of... Yeah, Cause right. it's, it's not correct. Right. It is not both sides. It is one clear side. And you can point to many, many reports. You can point to all kinds of stuff that's been reported. You guys have to, you have to pull it back. This is not us or them. This is you got to stop doing what you're doing, JD, and what you're doing, Mr. T, because you are Mr. T. you are you are not helping the situation. Projection and lies, that's all the left have. They accuse their opponents of precisely what they're guilty of. And we have another lady from The View, Chief Nincompoop Anna Navarro, who went on CNN to share more conspiracy theories. She's moved on from the Russian collusion hoax uh, business. Now she's suddenly worried about the folks in Springfield, Ohio. The problem is that Donald Trump, who I think, you know, if you were doing hurricane categories, he's on hurricane category five, whereas uh, the other side might be a two. And Donald Trump and J.D. Vance are not questioning their rhetoric. Right now, because of their rhetoric, because of what he said in that debate, there's been 33 bombing threats in Springfield, Ohio. That would not have happened but for this false conspiracy theory being spread by the vice presidential and presidential Republican candidate. And those Haitians in Springfield, Ohio, and those students and the people that are victims of these threats and everything that's going on there don't have 24-7 a secret service. Right? They're on their own. You know, she forgot to mention a couple of key facts, and I know the view ladies and CNN are allergic to facts, but every single bomb threat was a hoax, and the Ohio governor has confirmed that the hoaxes originated from overseas. I wonder who could be behind these bomb threat hoaxes? Who is the most to gain? Mm. Donald Trump's running mate, J.D. Vance, has been schooling the leftist activists in the U.S. media. Here's one example. President Biden passed a series of executive actions and illegal border crossings are now at their lowest levels in about five years, so much so that Greg Abbott is no longer busing so, people so to other cities. But I, let me I, ask no, 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 this, this is, fundamental questions. Please. 
Will families be separated under your mass deportation? And again, I do want to answer this question about families and about deportations, but you made this point that border crossings are lower. Border crossings at the southern border are lower because the Harris administration is sending more immigrants through the ports of entry. So instead of coming through the southern border, they're now being flown at taxpayer expense to the ports of entry all over our country. The number of illegal crossings, they're not any lower. They're just shuffling how the people well, are coming into the country the, in the first place. And this is very important. They're now, able to about process deportations. them more efficiently, but, but Greg Abbott's not but setting I them to other Kristen, states. I don't but want just, a border czar just, who makes it more efficient for illegal immigrants to come into this country. This That's question. why we have the problem that we have. And what he said there is 100% accurate. New data from the U.S. Customs and Border Protection shows nearly 530,000 migrants have flown into the U.S. under the Biden administration's mass parole program for countries such as Haiti and Cuba, Venezuela. And the figure is just for June to August this year. Fox News's Bill Melugin reports that another 813,000 migrants have scheduled appointments via the Custom Border Protection One app at ports of entry to be released into the US. And these are all called lawful pathways now. These were created by the Biden administration, so these numbers don't count as illegal crossings. You can see precisely what they are doing here. Joining me now is filmmaker and journalist Army Horowitz. Army, uh, that's more than a million migrants the Biden admin has allowed into the US via these programs, and they're here to stay. They're, they're not going to be leaving America because authorities admit they just don't have the resources to police those who overstay their visas. Look, uh, J.D. Vance is very good at this. He is smart. He has a command of the issues and knows how to use them as a rhetorical weapon. But frankly, to me, it really, that underscores the failure of Trump at the debate to effectively use immigration as the necessary rhetorical weapon he needed. He whiffed at it. Uh, he kept highly, he high, used as a stand-in for this important immigration issue this false uh, idea of people in Ohio eating eating pets. Um, that was a stand-in for immigration. When we have all of these data points, these important real data points, like the CPB uh, uh, data point, to use to really highlight the problem at the border. That's the problem. What do we do? We allowed, look, other than admittedly creating hilarious memes, what it did was it allowed the Democrats to reduce the potency of the immigration argument. It basically boiled down the immigration argument, allowed them to deflect it into and, and change the narrative into a, a fact check. That is a failure. We cannot focus on those things that are distracting and frankly untrue. Look, the president, President Trump should be running away with this election. The number one and number two issues in the country, the economy and immigration, he has massive leads on. But instead of running away with the election and making a, having a large lead, the lead is actually increasing for Kamala Harris. And it's, it's, the Republican Party needs to take a hard look at how the president, uh, president Trump is running this race because he, he has a chance of losing it when really this should be a, a, a win for him. Um, we'll get back to the polls and uh, this issue. I disagree with you. Yes, he's not a J.D. Vance. He's not a Vivek Ramaswamy or a Ron DeSantis. He, he's not a politician who can uh, do those debates in the manner that they would have uh, completed them. But it was three against one. And though this whole cat and dog business uh, has absolutely enraged the left, it has brought attention to the illegal immigration issue and the legal migration issue, uh, and there's focus on towns like Springfield, Ohio, when they really they were ignored up until then. So I'm not entirely sure that the outcome isn't what he would want, uh, but I do agree with you that, yeah, if he had a J.D. Vance in his ear, he, he would have... Uh, been able to just uh, fact check a lot of the nonsense that we heard during that debate in a far more uh, effective manner. Now, I want to ask you about uh, what Hezbollah has suffered 
uh, in recent hours. Nine people have died and 3,000 have been injured after a coordinated cyber attack on Lebanese militant group Hezbollah saw thousands of pages explode. Arab media reporting that around 500 Hezbollah fighters were blinded in the attack, which took place mostly in Beirut in southern Lebanon and also Damascus in Syria. Members of the terrorist organisation were previously told by their leaders to stop using mobile phones, smartphones to avoid Israeli surveillance. They were handed pages instead. Ami, tell me about how this attack uh, occurred and uh, what we know about it. Yeah, well, nobody knows for certain yet, but obviously there, there are a number of theories, and I think those theories are probably true. Mm. Um, listen, one thing the Mossad is known for is ingenuity and creativity, right? That's really what uh, it, it has. Um, and they have a history of, of, of really interesting ways of getting at their enemies. For example, when they killed Mugnia, uh, the Hezbollah leader, Iranian leader, uh, they actually put explosives in his headrest in his car. Sounds easy, extremely complicated. Uh, when they killed the engineer, Hamas uh, Ayash, who was called the engineer, uh, who was a, a leader of creating these IEDs, uh, that plagued Israel, uh, they were able to get uh, explosives into his cell phone and use that. What seems to have happened here um, is that they were, what they did was, what we think they did was they they put explosives into the pagers. Now, I spent time in, in southern Lebanon, in the Bekaa Valley, in Beirut, and I spent time with Hezbollah. And when I had to contact them, I couldn't call them on cell phones. They didn't have cell phones because they knew they were easily hacked. They were, they were all using pagers. And because they thought that this analog system was harder to hack, and in fact it is. So what we think is Israel did was it it it, it didn't go digital, but went analog. Uh, found the manufacturer, uh, which was in Taiwan, of these pagers. Somehow infiltrated the supply chain, whether in Taiwan the manufacturing facility or en route to to Lebanon. Uh, covertly were able to open up all of these thousands of pagers, put in uh, plastic explosives. Uh, reseal them so they couldn't be seen and noticed as being tampered with, and then sat there for we don't know how long uh, until they thought it was the right time uh, to, to use them, and then remotely access the pagers to overheat, thereby triggering the explosives. That's what the going theory is. It is an incredible coup they were able to pull off. Uh, kind of blows, use that, uh, that, that pun with intent, uh, for these, uh, these, these Hezbollah fighters uh, who are now going to see their 72 virgins, but frankly have their equipment blown off. So that kind of that kind of sucks for them. Uh, but you know, by the way, it, you know, I want to highlight one more thing about this issue. If we take this seriously for a moment, is that um, it also points out there's a couple of days ago, right before this, the Biden administration was pressuring Israel to stop escalating what's happening in 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 Lebanon. Really, Israel has to stop escalating. Do I have to remind the president? that Hezbollah has been bombing the north for almost a year on a daily basis. The bombing is so bad that Israel has had to evacuate the entire, the entire north of Israel has been evacuated because they can't live under those conditions. Yet, Biden is lecturing Israel that it can't escalate this thing just a couple of days before this happened. You know, shades of, and shades of, of when Biden told Israel, after Iran sent 300 missiles and rockets and drones in an unprecedented attack against the state of Israel, what did he tell Israel? He said, do not retaliate, otherwise you will lose my support. This is the situation that Israel finds itself in vis-a-vis -vis this administration. And so much pressure on the Netanyahu government to come to a ceasefire agreement, even though Hamas... Uh, uh, continuously uh, refuse to really meet any sort of uh, reasonable conditions. The pressure seems to be entirely on uh, Netanyahu as opposed to, to Hamas, who started this entire uh, catastrophe. Um, going back to US politics, um, I want to get your thoughts on this new ad campaign from uh, a conservative group that's targeting illegal immigrants in the US, warning them not to vote in the upcoming election. The Spanish language ads warn non-citizens that voting in a federal election is a crime punishable by deportation. But Army, the campaign 
also uh, tells Hispanic voters that it's their patriotic duty to vote, those of them who are citizens. Uh, what are the polls telling us about the Hispanic vote? Because it's been a very fascinating exercise to observe how it's uh, gone uh, towards the Trump camp. But I think since Harris was installed as leader, that uh, lead has diminished. Well, I, I think one of the great geopolitical mistakes the Democratic Party has made um, is that it, it, look, there's no question that it has encouraged Im illegal immigration uh, into this country and encouraged uh, Hispanics to come into this country because in their view, they think ultimately when they become citizens that they will all vote for the Democratic Party. And it's true that, that first-generation Hispanics outside of Cubans have been a bulwark for the Democratic Party. But what all the polls and all the studies have shown is that Hispanics are conservative, they're Catholic, they're hardworking, and they have, they have migrated toward the Republican Party over time. And I think it's going to be, end up being a catastrophe for the Democratic Party. But I want to point something else out about um, the illegal voting. Um, look, I think that there's no question that there is illegal voting. There is voter fraud that happens. It happened to me personally. I want to point that out. Now, when I did my voter ID video, um, the reason why I did that video is because when I went to vote uh, after maybe six months after my father passed away, and I voted in Los Angeles, the way it works there is you go, you give your name, there's a book. And in that book, uh, it lists all the names alphabetical order, so all the horrors were in order. And I saw my father's name was in there, which made sense. He only died a few months before, but his name was checked. And I asked them, why is his name checked? They said, well, somebody came in, gave his name, his address, and they voted for him. That was wow. clear voter fraud. And by the way, I showed the California Board of Elections, never got back to me, never cared. But the important point here is that, look, is there a mass, you know, there, the, again, what the Democrats are doing is saying, well, there is no mass amount of illegals voting. That's a falsehood. That's not real. Well, look, it's not real that all the illegal immigrants are voting. But let me tell you something which people seem to miss, certainly the Democrats do, is that in New York City, where I am, the New York City Council and the mayor passed a law for non-citizens to vote, to actually allow them to vote. Only yep. by the grace of the judicial system and the court, they threw that out. But the city is still appealing it, and Mayor Adams is still supporting this law to allow non-citizens to vote. So when you tell me this is not a real argument, this is something that Democrats are, in fact, trying to pass. Absolutely. Ami Horowitz, thank you so much for your time this evening. Always a pleasure. The left continue to play down the attempts on Donald Trump's life and they're continuing their dangerous inflammatory rhetoric, trying to paint the former president as evil, a modern-day Hitler, a threat to democracy and worse. Here is White House Press Secretary Corinne Jean-Pierre earlier today. President Biden has been clear-eyed about the threat uh, that the former president represents to our democracy. He's been clear eyed about that. Joining me now is Critical Dynamics Director of Law Enforcement Training, Keith Hansen. Keith, thank you for your time. Is the rhetoric we are hearing from the Democrats directly responsible for the attempts on Donald Trump's life? Oh, no, no, no. I mean, it's it's completely, completely disconnected. I mean, you know, we're, we're all intelligent enough to know, especially the mentally defective people, the leftists, of the United States are, are certainly smart enough to understand that, um, you know, uh, we're, we're dealing with a, an, an intellectually superior class here. So they speak in metaphors that the average person just can't really understand. So when they talk about crosshairs, they're, uh, you know, they're not really talking about rifle crosshairs. Um, and when they call him Hitler, they're not really implying that, you know, he's responsible for the death of six million people. We, we just can't comprehend as, and, and you remember, it was uh, Nancy Pelosi who said about Barack Obama, he's so intelligent that the vast majority of us really cannot begin to grasp or appreciate the depths of his intelligence. So I, I think it's just us, you know, <laughs> sub-intellectual peons um, that are just, you know, misinterpreting the words of these incredibly intelligent mm -hmm. leaders um, and, and, and acting uh, uh, unaccordingly. So, I, I, you know, there's, there's no connection there at all. Sorry no, for the sarcasm. No, the but, fact that the you know, suspect... No, know, it, no, it's, it's, no, I appreciate the sarcasm. But, you know, it, it's one of those things, like, we, we, we have to at least take a sarcastic approach to this here because, I mean, the truth of the matter is, is that this is vile, this is reprehensible, it is evil, 
Um, and, and yes, to answer your question in a very serious way, uh, I, I do believe that the Democrats and the progressive left in the United States is directly responsible for the uptick in violence. Uh, and, and, and this has been going on, this inflammatory, incendiary, violent rhetoric has been going on since Donald Trump first descended that elevator or escalator in the Trump Tower in 2015. He has been targeted. He has been slandered. He has been maligned. He has been threatened. And the again, the mentally defective left in this country takes that as a direct marching order. We've seen it once in Butler Township. We've seen it twice in Florida. And I have to be honest with you, unless we really start getting serious about protecting this man and, and other representatives, uh, elected representatives in this country or candidates, we're going to see a lot more of this. Well, I fear what would happen to the country if, if one of these attempts was successful. Uh, the suspect in this second assassination attempt has social media posts that are word for word what we are hearing from the Democrat leadership, just uh, supporting what you've just said about this rhetoric and, and how it can inflame people who are not mentally sound. And, and the talk has not stopped. It's, in fact, they're doubling down on it. Does that make you fear that another attempt on President Trump's life is just around the corner? I, I, I un Unfortunately, yes. I think the answer to that is yes. And, and more to the point, I, I think that there's a lot of people who look at this as a, as a game. Um, I'm, I'm seeing, you know, a lot of memes and a lot of cartoons and a lot of um, not, not, not coming from President Trump, but, you know, coming from Trump's supporters. Um, hey, Owen, too, as if to say, oh, you know, you tried twice and failed twice. I, it's going to become, I believe, a situation, uh, unless it's taken seriously at the highest levels of government, it's going to become a situation where somebody is going to try to be the person who actually is successful. Um, and, and they may spend the rest of their life in prison or they may die, but, you know, they will have achieved what nobody else has done. And perhaps they're looking at it as some type of act of humanitarianism where they're going to save the world. Um, or, again, it's just a mentally defective person. But it sets up a very dangerous stage where somebody will try to do this. And, again, I've said this many times, that the Secret Service and all of the force-multiplying agencies that are involved in protecting not only President Trump, um, but Vice President uh, Vance, or uh, uh, President, yeah, a little wishful thinking there, um, but uh, the, the nominee, Vance, as well as, as the current president and vice president, um, unless they start taking this seriously, we're we're facing a very very serious crisis here, and 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 we and we cannot uh, again we cannot turn away from the fact that the rhetoric from the Democrat Party and the progressive left in this country is is absolutely fueling this. If you were advising the former president, would you be? insisting he wear a bulletproof vest at all times, every time he's out of Mar-a-Lago, essentially. And how would you handle the, the rallies, the meets and greets he does? And, of course, he does like a game of golf. Uh, can he be adequately protected when you, you do have... Well, you've had eight years of this crazy rhetoric that, and how, mm -hmm. God knows how many people are out there who've got ideas about being the one to take him out. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think, you know, each individual venue, each individual rally, each individual appearance, each individual visit to the golf course in a non-official capacity presents a very unique security threat. Uh, clearly, the threat is elevated. Uh, we've had not one attempt, but now two attempts. Um, he is arguably the most targeted person in this country, perhaps even the world. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the security if protocols to have to be reviewed else, individually. Yeah. Um, and, and the bottom line is that, yeah, I mean, he should be wearing a vest. He should be limiting um, the exposure that he has until he can have some reasonable assurance that the people who are tasked with his safety and security actually have their game together. And to be honest with you, looking at a Secret Service that is filled with DEI hires, courtesy of people like Kimberly Cheadle mm -hmm. and the rest mm -hmm. of the Obama administration and the Biden administration, I would have serious doubts about the ability of many of these people to adequately protect any dignitary. Well, yeah, we saw the scenes in Butler and uh, some of those agents seem to be completely lost and, and uh, unfit for the job, to, to say the least. Uh, 
the media rhetoric around Trump, I think, is also adding fuel to the fire. It's not just the Democrats, it's the media who have normalised this sort of talk and promoted it. And our publications in Australia, I've got to tell you, are not much better. You could argue they're yeah. worse. I want to uh, just bring to your attention uh, an academic publication, The Con Conversation. They have a piece at the moment claiming uh, these attempts on Trump's life are nothing out of the ordinary in US presidential history, calling them fairly commonplace, despite also noting that the last attempt was in 1981 against Republican President uh, Ronald Reagan. That was six presidents ago. You're a security expert. How extraordinary are the threats against Donald Trump? Is this what every presidential candidate can expect? Or are we seeing something that's quite out of the ordinary? I, I think we're, we're experiencing something that is significantly out of the ordinary because we're dealing with an individual who is out of the ordinary. Um, this, is an, this is a person who is, is extremely polarizing. Uh, people, for whatever reason, either love him or they hate him. And the people who hate him, uh, the, the media in this country has made, it, they, they've literally built their ranks off of covering Trump nonstop. I mean, think about Twitter. Uh, back when Twitter was 140 characters, Trump could reach out with Twitter and literally stop the presses. Oh my God, there's a lot of pearl clutching. Oh my God, Trump tweeted something or Trump said something. And, and I think Trump is really one of the first people, real powerful people in this country who has defined, or I should say defied the, the standard paradigm, which is you make your statements through the media. But Trump knew that he couldn't trust the media, that the media was corrupt. The media was pushing an agenda. They had this hegemonic view of the United States, and it did not involve conservative principles. It did not involve capitalism. It involved the furthering of these progressive, democratic, socialist policies. And anything that stands in stark contrast to that worldview will be treated as a pejorative. It will be put down. It will be suppressed. It will be belittled. It will be made fun of. Um, and, you know, the one thing that I've said many times, Rita, is that when a Democrat makes an accusation towards an opponent, you can absolutely take it to the bank that it is a twisted, projected confession, that the person who utters the accusation <laughs> is they themselves representing a political body and an ideology that is guilty of far worse things than anything they're accusing their political opponents of. This is standard practice. For people who have an iota of critical thinking, we look at this and we take everything in through that lens. But unfortunately, the public education system in this country has bred a generation, several generations, of politically, socially, and economically illiterate people. And so these people take it at face value. Hell, in this country, you know, how many people are getting their news from 15 and 20 second segments and blurbs on TikTok? which is arguably populated mm. by the stupidest mm -hmm. human beings on the planet. And these people not only <laughs> fill our society, but here's the scary thing. They vote and they breed and they produce more stupid people who go out and vote for the first person who comes along and promises them whatever little treat that happens to tickle their fancy. Welcome to the world of American politics. It's not getting any better. It's only getting worse. And now that the violence is ramping up, literally, because the calls for violence are ramping up, I think this is kind of the, you know, to, to coin a phrase from COVID, the new normal. It's scary, but it's true. Well, I think uh, everything you've said uh, points to the fact that this is going to be the most consequential election we have seen in, in a very long time. Uh, Keith Hansen, thank you so much for your time this evening. My pleasure. Thank you, Rita.